Hello and welcome to this second video on your Edexcel Medieval History course, uh, England and the Anglo-Norman Kingdom 1053 to 1106. Uh, this second video will consider uh, the uh, Rebellion of 1088 and how William II was able to defeat it comprehensively. Um, you know, it's an outstanding achievement considering the, um, the scale of the rebellion uh, by Easter of 1088. So the main focus of today is to outline the events of, of 1088. Um, to explain why the rebellion took place in the first place and, and who was involved in it, and to make a judgment on Rufus's response. So we're looking as to why uh, William II, William Rufus, was able to defeat the rebels of 1088. Now, we're not going to attempt a 20-mark essay on this, uh, but it's good practice to, to give questions and to try and think in terms of how the exam board might uh, potentially approach this. I'd be surprised if there was a 20 marker specifically on the 1088 rebellion, uh, but we have to prepare just in case. So imagine this being the question, William Rufus successfully defeated the rebe uh, rebels of 1088 owing to the poor tactics displayed by the rebels. How far do you agree? So that's going to be our, our, our main focus from an examination perspective, and we'll return to this at the very end once we've considered all of the facts. So, um, Interestingly enough, rather than starting with the, the causes of the rebellion and, and doing that to start with, I just thought I'd, I'd give you the um, the extract that's been provided by Ed Excel uh, in the Pearson textbook, uh, which comes from the, the Peterborough manuscript of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Um, it is a contemporary document, so it's something that was written at the time, so these people would have been aware of the events. Um, this is, is their extract as to what uh, occurred uh, during 1088. So, you can pause the video uh, in, a, in a second and, and have a read through um, the account uh, from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle as to, to what took place. What we'll then do is we'll then delve into the reasons why this uh, rebellion came uh, about and, and how William Rufus dealt with th this particular problem. So now you have a bit of a brief outline as to what occurred in the 1088 rebellion. Let's just take a, a step back, back to September of 1087. Um, and this is the time when we know William I makes his, that deathbed decision that's so crucial. So on the 26th of September, um, 17 days after his father dies, William Rufus was anointed and crowned um, by the Archbishop of Canterbury at Westminster Abbey, uh, as his father had done as, and as Harold Godwinson had done. Um, it was, uh, you know, the, the almost seen as the lesser of the two options by a lot of, of magnates. The fact that Normandy was seen as the most precious um, commodity, um, but this quickly became apparent to, to a lot of the magnates that actually William Rufus had, had got the better deal out of all of this. Um, so the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that um, it was impossible for anyone to describe how much gold and silver was accumulated for William Rufus, how many costly robes and jewels, as well as many other precious objects that is difficult to list. He had an incredible amount of wealth. Um, he had a credible amount of area that he had in control. And if you contrast that to what, what Robert of Normandy had to deal with at the same time, he was finding that um, the, the running of, of the, the, um, the dukedom was incredibly costly and unsustainable. I mean, very quickly, um, you know, a few months after September uh, of 1087, um, he's having to, to get loans from uh, his own brother, his own brother, Henry uh, Beclerc, um, of, of three thousand pounds, so it's it's become very very quickly apparent that William Rufus has got the better deal, and obviously this is going to lead to, you know, a bit of resentment. But let's let's also focus a little bit on what those deathbed requests were, because this will specifically have an impact on who is involved in this 1088 rebellion. You might remember that uh, William's deathbed requests partly to, to save his own soul uh, in the afterlife, involved a number of different wishes, particularly uh, grants of money being provided to certain areas that he feel you know, William had felt as though he'd he dealt with poorly or dealt with too harshly, and the release of a number of prisoners. William Rufus complies with all of this, apart from um, the release of the Els uh, Morcar and, and Wolfnoth, Wolfnoth being Harold Godwinson's only uh, surviving brother. He, he doesn't let those Saxon uh, lords be released, but he does release a number of other people that cause problems for William, the most important of which was, was Bishop Odo, um, uh, who we know was William uh, the first half brother and, and obviously therefore is related to William Rufus by being half uncle. Um, he lets 
Odo um, go. He, he, he releases him. Um, and this very quickly backfires. Um, Odo is um, seen as somebody that's disturbing the peace almost. Um, you know, the country was greatly disturbed and filled with much treachery as the most powerful Frenchman in the land planned to betray their lord, the king, and have his brother Robert as king. At the head of this plot was Bishop Odo. Now, that particular uh, comment, uh, which again comes from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, really showcases that Odo is, is the person that's, that's behind the problems of, of, of early 1088, particularly around the Easter period. Um, it's it's interesting um, if you if you read a number of other accounts, particularly Orderic Vitalis, which kind of gives a bit of an insight into the sentiment uh, of Bishop Odo. Um, so he says um, in his thinking, potentially Bishop Odo, this is is Orderic Vitalis pretending to be Odo. How can we provide adequate service to two lords who are so different and who live so far apart? If we serve Robert Duke of Normandy as we ought, we will offend his brother William, who will then strip us of great revenues and mighty honours in England. Again, if we obey King William uh, dutifully, Duke Robert will confiscate our inherited estates in Normandy. And this is... Um, you know, the main problem that comes from the deathbed request of William I, that the ambition of Odo and um, the, the control that he particularly had prior to his arrest and imprisonment by William I in the area of Kent is going to cause issues. This is not somebody that's just going to um, be thankful to William Rufus and, and go along with everything. But we might actually be doing Odo a bit of disservice here, just kind of marking him as a bit of a troublemaker. We've got to understand that the, the William the First deathbed request involved dividing uh, the kingdom and, and his inheritance into two, into two different areas of, of Normandy and uh, of England. And this is also going to have an impact on all of the Anglo-Norman magnates. And to just say that it's Odo that's causing problems and, and is um, feeling aggrieved as to the decision of, of William the Conqueror is, is not true. It's, it, it's the case that actually the vast majority of, of those that had supported William the Conqueror, those chief Anglo-Norman magnates, those chief Anglo-Norman lords, um, they're, they're having their oaths of loyalty tested. You know, who do they support? Do they support the King of England, which is a relatively new territory for the Normans, who is the the second um, surviving son, remember third born son as well in William Rufus, or do they support the person that's in charge of the area that they've had for a, a longer period of time, um, that has, um, you know, by laws of primogeniture is the first born inherited son. And this again um, creates this, this perfect storm whereby William Rufus is inherited almost a poison chalice. He's somebody that now has an incredible amount of wealth, but does he deserve this? And is it the right thing for him to, to have um, the, the throne in the first place? And we can't say for in, in absolute certainty how the plot was uh, conceived and who was the, the chief orchestrator. We can say with um, a little bit of certainty that Odo is certainly the, the ringleader of this, but we don't know who created the plan. We don't know to the extent how far Duke Robert of Normandy was involved. Um, certainly he was informed of the fact that they were going to uh, rise up against William Rufus. We don't know the specific time frame. You know, certain sources are saying that by Christmas of 1087, the plot had, had come uh, with, with a bit of planning. We can say, however, that this isn't a, a random ad hoc approach. This is something that is coordinated and, and hence why I've, I've put this map up on the screen to talk through where the various different major players of, of this particular rebellion um, acted. Um, I mentioned there already that Robert of Normandy was involved of, of the plot. He pledges his support but at this time he's in Normandy so he's away from the events um, that we, we've looked at. So let's start off with uh, the major people that uh, are involved in the rebellion. Well, out of the doomsday top 10 landowners in the country, seven of them were um, you know, part of this particular rebellion. So only three really were supporting William Rufus. Um, the plotters included uh, William the Conqueror's four closest councillors, um, 
It also included the, the Doomsday Rich List, the top three richest individuals. Um, and these were people that held a number of different castles and lands across the country. So the reason why I'm showing this map is to really emphasize that spread uh, of the rebellion in 1088. So let's start off with Odo. Odo is, is our main uh, ringleader. And the first thing that he does is he establishes himself in Rochester Castle. Now, Rochester Castle um, is located in Kent um, and it's in an ideal location. It's located halfway between London, particularly the Tower of London, you know, the central point for William Rufus and Canterbury, the area whereby um, there would be um, uh, the, the support of the church as well. So it's an ideal location to set up a rebellion to, to cut that supply line. Um, he does that pretty quickly in Easter 1088, um, and um, he, you know, he realizes that with its location very, very close to the Isle of Sheppey, close to the Thames, he could get support from uh, from Normandy as well. So if there was the, the potential of having uh, troops from Robert of Normandy to fortify Rochester further, then they'd be able to do that. Um, by the summer of 1088, you know, the garrison at Rochester. Um, was about 500 knights, which which is an impressive amount of, of individuals. And, and Odo is somebody that, you know, is seasoned in battle. He's well respected by a lot of Normans. So we can't, you know, under underestimate and underemphasize the scale of this particular rebellion, even if it was just this. But in addition to that, we have a further number of issues uh, and, and problems across the country as a whole. Um, Robert of Mortain um, takes the castle at Pevensey. Uh, which is um, in, in Sussex, um, so it's right on the coast, really close to Hastings as well. Um, and that means that there's this corridor now that uh, you know, links Rochester, Pevensey and Normandy across the English Channel. So even if the troops couldn't get all the way into to the Thames or were perhaps blockaded there, there's a very clear and easy route to get to Pevensey Castle. Um, the other areas where there are problems are also in the West Country, so not just in London, but um, around the areas of, of modern day uh, Bath and, and Gloucestershire uh, and Bristol. Um, Robert of Mowbray um, and Bishop Geoffrey of, of also Mowbray, but he's known as Bishop of, of uh, Coutances. Um, they're, they're attacking this particular area here around Berkeley Castle, uh, around Bath. Uh, and they're raiding as well, even into um, uh, the areas of Wiltshire. Uh, we've got William of Ou who who raids uh, raids north into to Gloucestershire. So we're talking uh, this area here. Um, we've also got uh, Herefordshire barons who are burning Hereford, uh, Gloucestershire. Um, you know these castles that you can see here. Uh, so all across the, the southwest and the southeast, we have coordinated attacks across the spring and the summer of 1088. Um, we've also got subsidiary revolts that are taking place in Leicestershire. So around here, around Ashby de la Zouche. Um, we've also got problems in Northamptonshire. Uh, so this particular area here, we've got problems in Durham. So even further north uh, than the map that I've got here provides um, for you. If we are to, to say that there's a specific area where the, the revolts are mainly concentrated, then we would say it would be Kent. Uh, and this is just a, a map of Kent and where the main castles are. Um, you can see that um, the, the map here, so around this particular area, is where we've got Rochester Castle. Um, but it's not the only location. Sorry, I think Rochester is, is this particular one. Um, we've also got these castles um, around the Isle of Sheppey that are also fortified. Um, we've also got problems, as, as I've already mentioned, around Pevensey, which is, is around here. Uh, but we've got a fortification in Tunbridge as well in Kent. So this is mainly where the, the, the revolt and the rebellion begins. And, you know, that narrative that you read in, in Source 12 indicates the, the kind of tactics and strategies of these individuals as coordinated attacks all across the country uh, all at the same time. So far then um, you should be uh, you know writing some some comments down with the, the sheet that I provided or in the format that you prefer and really we should have this this idea that by the summer of 1088 
this is no small scale rebellion. This is, you know, a major crisis for William Rufus at the very start of his reign. One that, you know, might cost him um, the, the crown itself. So what we need to do is we need to advise William Rufus at the rebellion's height. You know, what do you do to deal with this particular situation? So we know that Bishop Odo and a number of other key um, individuals have garr garrisoned themselves uh, in the, the southwest. I forgot to mention that at Tunbridge, by the, well, uh, by the way, it's Gilbert Fitzrichard um, who fortifies himself at his castle uh, at Tunbridge. Um, we've got all the southwest Kent and Sussex really in the hands of, of the rebels, cutting that supply line between London and Canterbury. We've got rebellions popping up all across um, the country. Uh, you know, also we've got this issue of, of Durham. Um, so what should William do? And I'd like you to, before you, you find out what William actually does, I'd like you to decide what should be his plan of action? What would be the best strategy? So try and consider these particular factors when you're making your decision. Um, think about the geographical spread of, of the rebellion and what we've seen so far. You know, it is surrounding London almost. Think about his brothers. Think about Robert of Normandy, who hasn't come across yet. He hasn't done anything. Um, he hasn't provided um, a significant amount of troops at this particular stage. Think about William's wealth, um, something that we've already mentioned. He's inherited an incredible amount from his father. Um, think about the fact that some of these particular rebels as well, um, they do owe him debts. Um, they do owe him support and land um, as, as King of England. And think about his father's deathbed will as well. So take a bit of time now, pause the video, have a think about what you would advise William Rufus uh, to do uh, in the summer of 1088. So you've probably come up with a few ideas at, at that particular point. I'm going to throw two more spanners into the uh, into the work. So you've got um, two more problems that you have to deal with, uh, which are occurring in April of 1088. So all of these, these you know, uh, Rebellions are breaking out across the country. William's chief advisor, who's Bishop William of Durham, flees the royal court. He goes back to Durham um, you know, in, in disgrace. It's a propaganda defeat for William Rufus as well. If, if your chief advisor is fleeing because he's scared. The second problem as well that you've got is that Robert of Normandy um, has sent a fleet now from Normandy to support uh, Bishop Odo at, at Rochester Castle. And that's that's the left Normandy now. And um, that's also got the support of um, Robert and William's other brother, Henry Beauclerc. So now that you've got these two new facts at your disposal, do you change your mind? Do you still continue with the plan that you're going to advise William Rufus to do? Or do you change things up? So write down and jot down any new ideas that you've got. And we'll go through um, on the next slide what William actually did. So Here's what Rufus decided to do. So on May the 12th, um, the first thing that he, he had to do was send an arrest warrant out for the Bishop of Durham. You know, you can't have any kind of treachery from somebody that was meant to be your closest advisor. Um, you know, the author of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that um, what the Bishop of Durham did is, is akin to what Judas Iscariot did to uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. So um, Rufus decided to... Um, send out that arrest warrant for the Bishop of Durham. That's a problem that is kind of lesser, but it's it's setting a precedent. He's not going to accept anybody that um, you know, goes against um, what the royal court has, has wanted. These are the main ways, however, that he tries to deal with this rebellion. He targets the southeast and Kent specifically using siege tactics. Um, he's going to send all of his royal army there. If he breaks the head of the rebellion, um, that means that he could leave loyal English lords that he could reward afterwards to deal with the rebellions around the country. So don't spread your forces thinly. If they spread their forces thinly, then go for the head of it. Go for Rochester, go for Tunbridge, um, where the, the main magnates are. And around the country, there are forces that have been, um, you know, that have loyalty only to the King of England, not to the King of uh, the Duke of Normandy. The final thing that he needs to do is he needs to send a naval uh, fleet to meet the Norman reinforcements, which unusually have been sent by Eustace of Boulogne. If you remember that name, that's actually the person that was involved in the Kent Rebellion um, back in, in the 1060s, uh, I think 1067. 
Um, so 20 years later, Eustace of Boulogne is, is doing the same thing. He's causing problems in Kent. Um, so that's what Rufus decided to do. Um, what we'll now do is find out whether or not he was successful. Barring one minor hiccup, William Rufus's response is um, impeccable. It's an outstanding response to a very dangerous uh, rebellion. So the castle at Tunbridge was taken after a two day siege, incredibly short. Um, that's, that's really eliminated uh, one of the major threats uh, from the offset and it's cut that supply link between Pevensey and Rochester. So already we have Gilbert Fitzrichard um, has, has been uh, taken prisoner. The naval blockade of Pevensey and Rochester was successful, so they've successfully uh, blockaded the, uh, the Pevensey coast, uh, so the English Channel, um, and around the Isle of Sheppey and, and, and the Thames. As a consequence, the uh, relief forces that have come from, um, were being supported by Robert of Normandy and Henry, uh, don't materialise and, and aren't used um, for part of these rebels. Pevensey is, is then the next target, so uh, Pevensey, um, Odo had decided to move to Pevensey to try and garrison that particular force and, and try and keep that supply line open to Normandy. That's unsuccessful. There's effective uh, siege. There's an effective siege that takes place for six weeks um, by the forces of William Rufus and it's taken and Odo is captured uh, as a result. Now I mentioned that that one minor hiccup. This is the minor hiccup that William Rufus makes. He He's convinced by Odo that if He's taken to Rochester along with William Rufus that Odo can negotiate with those forces that are, um, are rebelling there and can get them to stop. You can imagine what, what's about to happen then. So they all go up to Rochester Castle. Odo uh, asks to go inside and speak to the people and just decides that I'm just going to stay there at Rochester Castle. I'm going to hold up and, and we're going to fight uh, there. It backfires, obviously. William is incredibly angry with this. He responds with fury, um, but incredibly effective siege tactics. Um, the, the tactics that he incorporates um, are, um, are twofold, really. The first is that he uses artillery to destroy the castle, which was a timber one at this particular time. He damages the cathedral. Um, so you've got the... Uh, the terror tactics of, of the artillery, but he complements that with uh, perhaps what was the best weapon, uh, which was the hunger and disease of the people in this overcrowded city and, and, and fortress. So because it is in the height of summer, um, as soon as men have died and they can't be buried, then you've got flies, you've got rotten corpses, rotten horses, um, and it becomes impossible for people to eat anything. So it doesn't last long until um, William is able to take over Rochester to uh, Rochester Castle. So now you've got to think, well, what does he do with all of these people that have gone against him, these seven rich magnates of, of the country? Um, the other magnates, um, because the head has been taken off, they don't survive that long. And actually some of the, the local sheriffs, uh, the local Norman sheriffs alongside with English bishops and, and English soldiers defeat the smaller rebellions in areas like Worcestershire and Herefordshire and Gloucestershire. So what does William Rufus now do? We know what his father was like and how he dealt with rebels. Um, so will he do the same thing? William Rufus decides to opt for clemency, for mercy, and it, and it is really surprising. Um, all of these key figures aren't executed. Um, you know, the English forces that had supported William Rufus obviously would want the rebels to be hanged for traitors. Um, the the route that he goes down is is trying to uh, to keep these these men relatively happy so that there aren't further rebellions and, and reprisal uh, rebellions as a result of this. Um, he allows even some of them to, to, to keep their their titles and, and to keep their, their lands. So for example um, Gilbert the Clare of, of, of Tunbridge and, and Geoffrey of Catons, um, they're able to keep their estates. Um, some of them, people like Odo and Eustace of Boulogne and uh, William of O, they don't keep their estates, but they're not imprisoned. Um, he doesn't give land to, to others that um, perhaps have, have helped him uh, as much. So it's a really interesting approach that William uses and and it is going to cause him problems as as he goes on. 
The two that he's most disappointed with are his brothers, Robert of Normandy and Henry, and we'll look at that in our, our next lesson as to how he's going to deal with those two individuals uh, and this, this issue perhaps of Normandy. Um, we mentioned already about the Bishop of Durham. Um, he does try the Bishop of Durham. Uh, well, it's done through an ecclesiastical court. Uh, Bishop Archbishop Lanfranc is at the head of that, um, and he does have his titles confiscated from him. But it's surprising that with such a, an extensive rebellion that William opts for this, this particular approach. So on the sheets that you've got, um, you should really be just making notes about what William does. But I'd like you to also complete that sheet, which involves um, the threat level that William uh, faced with this particular rebellion, just so that we've got that consistency across all the rebellions that we've looked at. So finally, um, coming back to the 20 mark question that we've we made reference to at the very start as to uh, why William Rufus was able to successfully defeat the rebellion, uh, the rebels of, of 1088. I'm not asking you to do the 20 mark question, but I am asking you to think about this and what your judgment might be. And um, it might be that you've already formed a bit of a, an idea as to why William was able to defeat the rebels. But I thought that I'd leave you today with the views of um, John Gillingham. Um, who is a uh, professor at LSE, so the London School of Economics and History. Uh, he's written a lot about um, 12th century and 11th century British history. Um, and he's he's written a, a summary, uh, his interpretation of the, the 1088 rebellion and why William was able to defeat the rebels. And he, and he boils it down to two factors. The first is the failure of Robert of Normandy to lend his support fully. It's an interesting point. I mean, if, if Robert was able to get his, his troops to Pevensey and to garrison Kent as a, as a real stronghold, then it's it's definitely the case that we perhaps would have seen a pitch battle take place where perhaps William Rufus wouldn't have been as as fortunate as he was in, in the, the, the summer of 1088. We're not fully sure as to why William, um, sorry, uh, why Robert of Normandy didn't lend his full support, didn't send himself over there himself and try and take England uh, as part of his, his Norman Empire. Gillingham's suggestion is that Robert didn't really prioritise England. He, he'd hardly been to England at all during his time um, and this was before being Duke of Normandy and for him it was more important that he consolidated the areas around Normandy itself. We know the problems that Normandy faced as well prior to 1088. We also know that he's got issues in terms of money and, and funding at this particular point. So it's not straightforward to just say, yeah, he can um, he can definitely, uh, you know, lend his support and, and go over there. The second vital factor that Gillingham uh, gives is that Rufus's determination and strategic decisions at this particular point were outstanding. So compare what William actually did with what your plan was. Was it pretty much in line? Um, do you think that William actually could have done something better um, because Gilliam says that actually he's got it spot on in terms of his tactics. So that's the end of, of your second lesson uh, for remote learning. You'll get one uh, later this week, uh, which will be on our next topic, which will be about how William uh, Rufus decides to deal with this issue of Normandy from 1091. So what's he going to do with Robert of Normandy? What's he going to do with his brother Henry as well? Thanks very much for listening.